mixing with my mixing tip of the week, we're going to talk about selecting the best vintage EQ. Now, um, this is sort of a, in a way, kind of a trick question, like the best vintage EQ is as if there's like one that you're going to select that would be the best, like, you know, the, the uh, Poltec EQP1 EQ 1A, you know, is like the greatest EQ of all time. And the thing to understand is that every type of EQ has a, a different sort of characteristic that um will uh benefit the particular sound it is that you're working with so for example if i'm working with a bass one of the things that that um works well and uh, uh can be really helpful with a bass is working with sort of transformer bass components and the neve stuff is really particularly good so for example if i'm if i got this uh this bass track right here then there's a couple of things that I can do here. One of the things I like about the Shep 73 is that I can kind of work with and even overdrive, you know, um, the input if I want to, which is kind of cool, just like driving over, overdriving the natural input, but it also emulates the preamp section, which gives a subtle tonal variation. So I can do whatever I want with it. But now when I got this, the thing that's really cool about this, it's, it's, um, when I start to apply equalization, it has a characteristic warmth to the sound that you wouldn't get, for example, with a passive EQ like a Pultec EQ. Um, and so this is a natural good fit for a bass. So for example here, if I wanted to warm up the, the low end or low mids of the bass, I can do a nice shelf here and just add a little bit here on, on the low end. And it doesn't ever seem to sound muddy. And uh, even if I wanted to add like a little bit of note in here so that we can, you know, it'll kind of cut through on smaller speakers a little bit better. So let me kind of put this in the context of, of some of the other tracks here, and then uh, we can listen to I can even warm up the top a little bit. And you can hear how like nice, nicely it just images. Obviously, it mixes with another sound. I could probably just copy these settings right here. And, and although, you know, this um, added on right here might be just bordering on a little bit too much, you could hear how it adds imaging and depth and body into the sound. So where would we use something like a Pultec? Well, a Pultec actually for like... Um, uh, which is something like, for example, on a snare drum is like a classic way to get a nice um, um, snap and bite, you know, out of a, a snare drum and also get a bit of body. So if, uh, let's just kind of, I guess I'll just kind of go with the um, the uh, Puig Tech here, the EQP-1A. And in this case, one of the most classic things to do here with a snare is to kind of boost like the low end at 100 cycles and with a slight attenuation chaser and what this does is it helps to create the filter actually in in actuality the attenuation and the boost don't happen at the identical frequency uh, the attenuation actually happens at 100 cycles but the boost starts a little bit below that and so what happens is you get a little bit of a ripple in that gap that's in between and that ripple is like a resonance which actually has a really cool kind of character so it's not uncommon to kind of do a little bit of a boost and a little bit attenuation at the same time, which doesn't sort of make sense. You think they'd sort of negate each other, but they don't really. It helps to shape the sound. So like if I wanted to kind of give the snare, um, let me just, oh, and this is actually a sample snare, but I'll kind of copy and paste the settings here. I can also give this a little bit of a snap here. And it never seems to sound not musical. 
Like, even though I'm adding a lot of stuff there, it doesn't seem to ever, you know, kind of be problematic. So let's just, uh, let's see if I can work with this with the original snare. The snare may need a little more love than a pull tech can give it. And I can even, it's got like a, an attenuation on the top end. Which can add a warming presence to it. And what it does is it adds like a body and warmth that is almost like unnatural to the way that it exists within the track. Another classic, um, and there's so many to go through here, but what we're looking for is how the individual characteristics help to enhance the sound. So um, something along the lines of a guitar part, let's see what I can find here that's just uh, um, quickly available. Sometimes with like a like a tonal shaping thing, one of the the coolest things is like um, the API 560, and uh, the API 560 is like a real cool. It's just like a a, a parametric EQ and um, or a graphic EQ, excuse me. And uh, what's really cool about this is that when we kind of work within particular frequency areas, the API actually gets narrower as you boost more or attenuate more. So the bandwidth or the, the Q narrows and that becomes particularly important and really great and amazing for guitars because if you want to focus like, if you want to really focus in on a particular, a particular tone, you can literally create a shape for the sound, you know, with it um, as you kind of, um, And what this does is it actually allows you to do some things that are much more radical in terms of the amount of equalization without taking away the musicality of it. And, and that is like, so it just, uh, the guitar ran out there, but that's the basic idea. Really, really amazing for that type of thing. Um, and uh, this can also work really amazingly well for basses where you're trying to reshape a sound. Um, every EQ has something that it just um, is very special with. If you're familiar with um, the Waze Manny Marikin EQ, and what he did was that he noticed that there were particular frequencies that he liked from all these different vintage compressors and the way that he kind of put that together was he said you know i i like this particular frequency 220 from a, a 1073 and so he would put that shelving setting and that would be like a particular setting that would be in his eq and then he would have like these different things maybe the high shelf from a, a, a ssl 9k etc cetera, etc cetera. and he would go through this whole thing and he would kind of put um all of his favorite eq into one plugin it was really cool about it is that um, he's getting like all these sort of magical frequencies, like the, the the best frequencies or parts from each of these vintage compressors, a really, really, really cool plugin from in that regard. But even if you're working with the individual components, you have to sort of play with them a bit because it's hard Like you have to dig through the manual to find out what those different things are and not all those other things have been emulated from other places. So it's a great EQ, but doesn't always serve every purpose. But when you're selecting a vintage EQ, it's not like, oh, just throw a Neve and that'll be like the answer to everything. It's like, well, no, maybe that's better for drums and bass, for warmth or where you want warmth and body. And it may be really appropriate for a particular guitar where we want to give it like uh, we want to add brightness, but we don't want it to be harsh. 
So we use something like a EVQ with the transformers that gives it a warmth so that when you add in those high frequencies, it's not so cutting or biting. Or the API where we can really dig in and reshape it. Or the Pultec where we can do something in a very clean, sort of transparent way. And the tubes and transformers built into that add the body and the air um, in a very, very, very clean way that doesn't really shape it musically. Um, uh, you know, it's not a, like a big tonal shaping kind of thing. Um, each one has a strength, each one has a weakness. And so really get to know the components that make up those different EQs. And you'll have much more success in the process of working um, with um, uh, vintage equalizers. There you have it. So mixing with Mike tip uh, for this week, uh, selecting the best vintage EQ.